This is a course about uh, the causes of social conflict. Uh, I'm not interested in social conflict from the perspective of a political scientist or a sociologist. I'm interested in intergroup conflict, but not at the level of group analysis. I'm interested in what role social identity or group identity plays in individual psychology and why it is that individuals are motivated to participate in acts of social conflict. Um, I am using for an example here the Holocaust. I was thinking last week, writing part of the preface to the book that you're going to read, about the Holocaust Museum in Washington. There's a lot of, that's a, obviously this is a museum to the, to the Jews primarily who were killed by the Nazis in World War II. And there's a number of museums like this throughout the world and their central motto is never forget. And this has always been confusing to me, this notion of never forgetting, because I don't think you can remember something that you don't understand. And I don't think we understand why the Holocaust happened in World War II. Uh, I, think, I think you might regard the Holocaust as an unlearned lesson, and I don't think that you can process information that you don't comprehend. So to say never forget, begs the question is, what is it that you're supposed to remember? And is it the fact that six million people were killed? Is it, is it the fact of that particular event, or are you supposed to be giving some consideration to Holocaust-like events that have occurred throughout history? Because there are people who think that what happened in World War II was a relatively unique event, and something unparalleled in history. This is not a position that I adopt. I think, actually, it's a very common sort of event. Uh, it was perhaps it, it was the event of that sort that has proved most shocking to uh, the European conscience, so to speak. But it hardly strikes me as unique. And people often talk about the Holocaust in terms of the relationship between the Jews and the Germans or between the Jews and the Nazis, with the Jews obviously playing the part of victims and the Nazis often are always playing the part of the perpetrators, and of course this is absolutely comprehensible from the historical point of view, but it also strikes me that if what we remember is that the Nazis killed the Jews, that we're already on the road to making a mistake that's similar to the mistake that was, that was made that led to the Holocaust to begin with, which is to identify characteristics that lead to patterns of action of that sort as characteristics of groups, identifiable groups, and it seems to me, I mean I'm not trying to equate the role of the Jews and the Nazis in producing the Holocaust. That would obviously be absurd. But what I'm trying to say is that the lesson seems to me to be, especially when you consider that the propensity for Holocaust-like uh, events is deeply rooted in human nature, the, the, the lesson to draw from the events of World War II is that that's what human beings are like, not what the Nazis were like. Because these sorts of events happen all the time. I mean, it's obviously the case that there are, there are well, in the 20th century alone. Uh, well, the English invented the concentration camp in South Africa. The Germans perfected it. The Chinese used it to great advantage. Solzhenitsyn estimated, I'll show this on the next slide, that 66 million people in the Soviet Union were killed as a consequence of internal repression, many of whom went through camp-like procedures on their road to their demise. You see ethnic cleansing occurring in places like Rwanda and even once again in Europe, in the Balkans. Whatever it was that we were supposed to have learned from the events of the Second World War hasn't been learned nor been remembered because you can't remember what you don't understand. And that's what this course is about. I'm, I've been working for, since 1985, I guess, on trying to figure out what it is about people. Remember Hannah Arendt, maybe you know this, maybe you don't. She's a famous political scientist. She was a student of Martin Heidegger. She wrote a book called The Banality of Evil, and one of her points was that these people, she was talking about the Nazis in particular, people who perpetrate events like this, if you meet them, if you talk to them, if you have encounter with them, the thing that's often striking about them is not their striking abnormality or their evident evil, but the fact that they're very much like other people that you might have met which I suppose might not be surprising, so surprising when you think about how thoroughly, for example, the Nazi movement dominated the German consciousness, or likewise with communism in, in the Soviet Union. I mean, those ideological movements characterized people. They didn't characterize some strange sort of misfits whose consciousness 
was characterized by something incomprehensible that led them to perform the kind of actions that we're theoretically supposed to remember. My, my perspective on all this is that the fact that people are capable of perpetrating atrocities like those that characterize the Holocaust says something about what people are like, what everybody's like. Because it strikes me that that, that kind of tendency is something that's deeply rooted in human nature. And then to say that, but well, what was it about the Nazis or what was it about the Soviet communists that led them to participate in this sort of behavior is completely beside the point, in a sense. All that does is you're looking for some sort of group characteristic that's devoid, and you don't have any personal relationship with that group. The problem is instantly made abstract, and as far as I'm concerned, if it's abstract, well then, once again, nothing is remembered. Now, what I want to do is to try to, I want to outline the reasons why something like the Holocaust could have occurred, and what it is about us that make us so concerned with protecting our group identities, what those identities mean, what role they play in the regulation of emotion, that's the critical thing right there. For me, ideologies are, are, are the expression, in a sense, the verbal expression of the internal structures that regulate our emotions. When you mess around with someone's ideologies, therefore, as a consequence, you're messing around with the inhibitory structure that regulates the interplay between their emotions. So what we're going to study in part in this course is what emotions are and uh, how they're rooted in neuropsychology and neurophysiology and how they manifest themselves in behavior and how they might be controlled and how that might tie into uh, something as abstract as social identity. Usually there's, there's not much of a, a link made between the concept of sociological processes, so to speak, and intrapsychic processes or neuropsychological structures, but it's obvious, if you think about it for a moment, that whatever your identity is plays some role in regulating your emotional nature and your, and your physiology, because your thoughts are embodied, they're part of your mind, they're part of your brain, <coughs> if you want to get right down to it. People have belief systems, and they'll do anything to protect them, and I find that peculiar. What is it that's so important about a belief system that would lead people to do things, normal people, as far as I'm concerned, to commit acts that under normal circumstances would, would be conceived of as incomprehensible even by those people? If you want to see an awesome video of a young Wayne Dyer, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there. People do things to you, of yeah. course. It happens all the time. But what happens to you in your life is you live your life inside. Yeah. And it isn't what people do to you. It's how you react.